Welcome everybody to this new talk of the series organized by the Museo Egizio in collaboration with the ACME, the Association of Friends and Collaborators of the Museo Egizio. I'm Paolo Del Vesco, one of the museum's curators, and tonight I have the huge pleasure to welcome and to briefly introduce um, the speaker, our, our guest, Leire Olabarria. I'm going to read this. <laughs> Leire Olabarria holds a DPhil in Egyptology from the University of Oxford, and currently she is a lecturer in Egyptology at the University of Birmingham, where she also acts as academic lead of the Eton Myers Collection. Her main research areas include kinship and marriage, ritual landscapes, monumentality, memory, funeral archaeology of the Middle Kingdom, and the construction of Egyptological knowledge. She is also interested in the receptions of ancient Egypt in popular culture, having published on heavy metal music and counterfactual literature. So tonight's talk, titled Making Memories in Middle Kingdom Egypt, will be focused on memory, <laughs> of course, and monuments, and especially monuments from uh, the Middle Kingdom um, and the site of Abydos. So I leave now the stage to our guest, and thank you, thank you for being here. Okay, can you, can you all hear me? Yeah? Good? Very well. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here today. I'm delighted to be here. I'm really, really sorry because I'm not here to talk about heavy metal today. I really apologize. Um, I'm really grateful to the Museo Egizio for the invitation uh, today and um, for giving me the opportunity to, to come back to touring because uh, I have very good friends living here in Turing. I don't get to... Sorry, I think. Better? Yeah? Okay, very good. <laughs> so, um, yeah, as I was saying, I'm really, really grateful to the museum for the invitation to, invitation to come here today. Um, I have some really good friends living here in Turing. I don't get to see them often enough, so um, this is a very good opportunity for me to, to come and see them and also to come and share my, my research here with you today. Uh, before I start, in addition to thanking the Museo Egizio and obviously Paolo for that introduction, I, I also want to thank um, everyone at the office for making uh, my coming here so much easier. And I want to thank Gabriele and Sara, they are at the back, they are the interpreters. And uh, I apologize in advance because especially when I get very nervous, I have a tendency to talk very very, very fast, so I'm going to make it very difficult for them tonight because I'm a bit nervous, you see. But uh, thankfully, they, <laughs> they are there to make everything easier for all, for, for all of us. Anyway, so usually my work, for those of you who know me or may have uh, read something I, I've written, um, focuses on, oh my god, this is very loud. Is this all right? Yeah? Okay. Uh, my work fo focuses on kinship and marriage in ancient Egyptian material from the first and um, um, intermediate period to the Middle Kingdom. So I'm talking roughly 2100 to 1600 BCE. And trust me when I, when I'm, when I say that I'm very used to getting like blank looks from colleagues because when I say I work on kinship, they're expecting to see diagrams like this that look very, very scary. Um, but today, I'm not really here to talk about this type of diagrams, right? I'm here to talk about a different dimension or perhaps a different aspect, a different way of approaching uh, kinship and this is going to be through the idea of memory and commemoration because kinship as I understand it intersects many other topics such as uh, gender uh, social hierarchies and of course memorialization as we will see today so I will be focusing on memory and on the uh, on the way social relationships are basically materialized in um, in monuments so what I will be doing today is, uh, for starters, I will be focusing on the theoretical 
my theoretical background for the study of memory, namely the notions of social memory, and I will say a little bit about cultural memory as well. Then I will be addressing the idea of um, the monumental records, to what extent monuments really embody uh, memory. Um, and I will also introduce an idea uh, that is called technologies of remembrance. This is from theoretical archaeology, and um, is just to give an idea of how monuments may be uh, consolidating a given idea of, uh, of a group. Um, then I will be focusing on abiders as a site of memory, um, focusing on how memory is sometimes embedded in one particular archaeological site. And then I will give you one case study in particular, um, the case study of Nefernai. We will meet, we will meet him later, later on, but this is from the late Middle Kingdom in Abydos. And I will finish with some you know, final remarks um, summarizing everything that I'm planning to tell you today. So um, now I have a confession to make for all of you. What I'm planning to do here today is that I'm giving you like a snippet of something that I'm preparing for publication. Um, so I would be especially grateful if you have any feedback, if you have any ideas or suggestions for this topic, because I'm working on, through this material um, right now. So, well, um, I told you that I would start with this um, kind of theoretical background to memory, and I should start, start by saying that memory has been a hot topic in the humanities and the social sciences for a very, very long time. Not least because it can be interpreted from multiple perspectives. For example, some people may be interested in how memory helps in the development, development of identity, or how memory perhaps is manipulated or used in order to construct given ideas of the past. Um, and I think since the Second uh, World War, particularly, studies of memory have tended to be based on computational approaches to memory. So what we see is um, models that would understand the human brain almost like a powerful computer. When you have you know, a number of inputs and outputs, you put information in, you get information out. It's all very computational, the way that information is retrieved. But there are many other models of memory around. For example, from the 60s, there are um, models of memory in three stages that many of you may be familiar with, may have heard about before, that deal with sensory memory, short-term memory, and then going on to long-term memory. These are all um, a couple of examples of different mem uh, models of how memory uh, works that exist around. But actually, the, the difference between these different stages is not as clear-cut as it may seem from a diagram like this one that you have on the screen. Um, my point here is that many of these models, and these are just two examples, really raise questions about the uses of memory. What is really memory? If the main task of memory is just to retrieve information that we have in our brain, then there is really no difference between memory and commemoration and knowledge. What I would say is that these types of models and kind of metaphors to interpret and to assess memory say more about how, not, not about how memory works biologically, but they say a lot about how um, memory is understood socially from our own perspectives. Um, and again, I want to emphasize that there is not just a single way. What I want to say is that the idea of memory and these models are very flexible, and for this reason we need to um, make sure that we accurately um, define how we understand memory for each particular context that we study. And in the last few years in Egyptology, there have been many uh, studies about memory, really. Um, I, ha I have a brief selection here. We have uh, Meskel, who I know, uh, Lynn Meskel is coming later on this year, I think, for this uh, lecture series as well. She has published on commemorative memory. Uh, also, Chloe Ragazzoli has worked on graffiti um, as creators of spaces of memory. And here you have an example that was co-edited by um, Dr. Chiara Salvador, who made uh, the effort to come here within her busy schedule. So thank you so much for, for being here in this lecture today. And more re most recently, we have the work of Ellen Morris, for example, who worked on the topos of famine as a tool to um, mobilize ideas of social memory. However, I would say something. A lot has been written about memory, but I would argue that it is surprising that not even more has been written about memory in Egyptology. And I say this because, you know, one of the most uh, famous Egyptologists, of course, Jan Asman, developed his theories of cultural memory in the early uh, 1990s. Now, something that, that I would say is that 
Unfortunately, I had to alter this very slide earlier this week because John Asman passed away a few days ago. So I have changed this slide just to, uh, to reflect that. Um, so his works on cultural memory, as we probably all know, we all know, have been used by colleagues from many, many different <coughs> different disciplines. His study of memory was part of a much larger project uh, developed at the University of Heidelberg in which they intended to map uses of cultural memory throughout history and across different cultures, but of course he was focusing mainly on Egyptology. According to Asman, there were four types of memory. We have mimetic memory, we have memory of things, communicative memory, and also probably the most famous of the four, cultural memory. Now, the difference between communicative and cultural memory is what interests me the most here today, because communicative memory, it focuses mainly on, on people in relation to their ancient past, and in some of Asman's work, um, you know, it's given like a, an expiry date. Uh, we get that communicative memory usually lasts for around three generations or around 80 years. Cultural memory, on the other hand, uh, what we have is a number of fixed points in the past that become kind of symbolic moments um, and traditional um, um, remembrance is anchored on, the, on those moments. Now, cultural memory in Asman's work is concerned mainly with reception and also with transmission. And this may remind you of something that I was saying earlier. And he focuses very much so on the role of writing and reading in those processes. Um, so the, the notion of cultural memory has been adopted by many Egyptologists to explain, for example, the transmission of motives in, in art. And um, here you have examples such as the king smiting, um, smite, smiting the enemies. Now, I would say that I see mainly two main problems with this approach of communicative and cultural memory. Uh, first, I think this clear-cut distinction of memory into four different types, as we've, we have seen from those earlier models, is often very difficult to differentiate. It's very difficult to make such a clear-cut distinction. It may be useful from a, um, as a heuristic tool, but um, it kind of suggests that meaning and, um, um, and objects can be split. And this is not something that I advocate, as we will see later on in the presentation, because I think that objects and meanings exist within networks of relations. The second problem that I see with this approach is that it assumes some, somehow a direct transmission. Um, it assumes that this memory is almost something that is handed down, as I mentioned. And this, I think, promotes a very computational view of, of memory and of the mind. But I think that social knowledge and cultural knowledge is not something that can be simply handed down as a thing, because memory, as I was saying, exists within a complex network of relations that involves interactions among people, objects, um, things, and, and the landscapes as well, the environment. So instead, my research is more focused on the work of uh, Maurice Halvash and um, is informed by social aspects of memory. So this one, is this better? Yeah, very good. Um, okay, so, um, Halvach was very much inspired by his, uh, by his mentor, Emil Durkheim, and uh, he, um, in, he, he developed a, a, a different kind of theory of memory that, was, uh, that he referred to as social memory. So um, according to him, social and individual memory are very much articulated and they inform each other. How about set things like, for example, while the collective um, memory endures and draws strength from its uh, base uh, as a coherent body of people, it is individuals as group members who remember. So what he's saying is that, yes, we remember individually as individuals, but this should also be considered uh, a social phenomena because those groups are providing kind of anchoring points to those individual remembrances. And this is what I find particularly interesting, this idea of the of memory being anchored in social practice. So um, what I like about this approach is that the, 
he's treating memory more holistically. He's not separating it into and splitting it into a small different sections. And he's treating memory as a whole phenomenon that is mediated by society. Yes, there may be different ways of remembering, but all of them are mediated by social experience. And this, as I said, includes people, objects, the environment, and so on and so forth. Now, this is probably sounding all really, really abstract. I'm probably starting to lose some people over here, but don't worry, I'm about to show some pretty pictures right now. Uh, because what I'm interested in is investigating how social memory operates in practical terms. How do we take this leap from this idea of, social, of memory as a social phenomenon and then ancient Egyptian archaeology? And I would argue that monuments are the obvious place to do that because monuments are recognizable to everyone. Um, so many, many um, monuments, well, monuments were generally made to endure. And they, many of them also feature inscriptions that explicitly point at that desire for commemoration. Now, the Oxford English Dictionary defines monument as a statue, building, or other structure that was erected to commemorate a famous or notable person or event, or something that is um, erected in memory of the dead. So this idea of commemoration is very much embedded in the idea of what is a monument. And this is hardly surprising because, of course, the word monument comes from the Latin uh, term uh, monio, monere, uh, which means to remind, to warn, to advise. So we're seeing that a monument is a reminder of something. Now, this was also the case in ancient Egypt. Uh, we have a number of terms that referred to refer to memory um, and that uh, could be used for the term monument and also for the verb to, uh, to remember. One that may be familiar to many of you is of course the term menu, which means monuments. This comes from the verb many, to endure. Also a verb like, for example, seha, seha is to remember. Seha could be used for memory and also uh, as another word for monument as well. And how are these used? What do they tell us about this interaction with monuments? Let's have a look at one particular example from one inscription. So we see this um, early Middle Kingdom monument of Intef that is very clearly expressing this link between memory and monumentality. So over here, what Intef is saying is, I found the cat chapel of the noble Henti Iker destroy, its walls being old and all of its statues broken, and there was no one who would remember it. This is really interesting because it's really implying that something can only be remembered when it leaves a physical monumental trace. And in addition, it needs to be taken care by those people around so that that memory can be actualized and maintained. Also, at the bottom of this same stela, there is like an addendum to this inscription where Intef tells us why he did this. He said, I did all of this, so making sure that the monument is well maintained, so that my name may be good on earth, and so that the memory of me, Intef, may be good in the necropolis. So what he's saying is linking this um, idea of restoration and the good state of the monument to the maintenance of memory, and he's highlighting a number of reciprocal benefits. I mean, this is going to be good for you, but this is going to be good for me as well. And we will go back to this idea. Many other inscriptions also imply kind of a relationship between memory and monumentality, uh, particularly because they associate the perpetuation of the name of a person with it being carved on an inscription on a stela and being repeated by uh, passers-by. So uh, being remembered by, by um, through the utterance of one's name, is something that is reciprocally uh, beneficial for people who leave the stele behind and people who pass by as well. Here we have the Middle Kingdom stele of Montehotep, and there is one section of the inscription that reads, as for uh, the one who will remember, and they use the verb seha again, my good name, I shall be his protector by the side of the great God, Lord of the sky, in the presence of the great God, Lord of abiders. So what we have here again is this reciprocity if you remember my name, if you repeat my name, I will protect you. It will be good for you as well. We have several stock phrases that continue to use this word seha, which, as I said, refers to monuments and to memorialization as well. Here we, we have this dealer from uh, Durham as well, where we have 
it is my good name that you should remember. Here they use the term Seha as well, at the Temple of Osiris. Here we're seeing how this remembrance is very much locational, right? The expression converts the site adjacent to the Temple of Osiris into a stage for memorialization. What we see here is an anchoring of all these monuments um, um, to archaeological sites. In this particular case, this will be Abydos, and I will be talking about Abydos later on um, uh, tonight. So the relationship between artifacts and remembering is really, really important, as we see from, from for archaeological research, because monuments construct and also sustain those social practices, and they have an effect on the memory of those groups. And remember, we were saying how those individual memories are anchored on those groups. And what I, what I am arguing here is that that anchoring of the memory to the group could be done by means of monuments such as this one here. But how does this happen? Well, I think inscriptions such as this ones start to give us an idea of how this happened, what methods were actually carried out in order to perpetuate that memory. We have the repetition of someone's name. We have the restoration of those monuments. We have the link in the memory to one particular site that becomes a site of memory. And these are all strategies that were used by social actors of the time in order to encourage remembrance of an audience. Now, in an edited volume from 2003, archaeologist Andrew Jones, whom you have here on this slide, um, included a paper in this volume from 2003 called Technologies of Remembrance, Memory, Materiality and Identity in Early Bronze Age Scotland. And there he introduced this idea of technologies of remembrance. And this refers to the materialization of memory in this context of Bronze Age Scotland. He further developed this concept in his 2007 monograph, Memory and Material Culture. Now, in this book, John Jones refuses to interpret artifacts simply as symbols or simply as units of information. What he's doing is, is placing those monuments as mnemonic tools that have an impact on, on an audience. So what he's doing is paying attention to that network of relationships of which monuments are part. And he literally says, memory is not a function of the internal processes of the human mind. Memory is produced through the encounter, encounter between people and the material world. And this world encounter is reminding us of those relationships that he is emphasizing in his work. So, what he's saying, and something that I agree with, is that memory is not something that simply happens, it's something that people do and people make happen. And there is here a kind of double agency. On the one hand, we have um, how those people who are commemorated, who use some socially sanctioned methods, that would resonate with those peoples that will commemorate them. So this is why I say that, con that memory happens through these objects in the context of the, um, of the group. So what I have tried to do is to take this idea of technologies of remembrance and try to use it with material from the Middle Kingdom, from Abydos, and this is what we will try to do for the rest of the presentation today. So what kind of... Um, things that we need to bear in mind when we look at these objects. Well, display is, of course, a key method in order to ensure remembrance, because allowing other people to see those monuments will ensure that you can establish that connection with an audience. And this is specifically mentioned in the inscription of Antef that we saw um, earlier. If a monument is ruined, there will be no one there that will remember that monument or that will remember, that will remember us. But following Jones, having that monument is not enough. You cannot simply have a monument and wait for memory and commemoration to happen. This interaction with the audience is very much required. And the notion of these technologies of remembrance, it's reminding us that objects do not embody memory on their own. There are these focal points within these networks of interaction and uh, social practices. And those social practices include material culture, landscape, people, and also physical actions, as we will see. At this point, I want to bring up the work of Paul Connaughton. 
um, who was a sociologist and anthropologist, and he makes the important point that the process of remembering will be facilitated by bodily practice. He says, for example, if there is such a thing as social memory, we're likely to find it in commemorative ceremonies. But commemorative ceremonies prove to be commemorative only in so far as they are performative. Performativity cannot be thought without a notion of bodily automatisms. As we see from this quotation from Conaton, for example, uh, this idea of memory is very much focused on this repetition, of this, on this iterative practice, and uh, is also achieved and done through embodied experience. And what we see here is a quasi phenomenological approach that is challenging this computational model of memory that I was presenting earlier. It is associating memory with personal experience and also with perception at this point. Now, Conaton's idea of commemoration is focusing on, as I say, performative practice around objects. And this is also a way to contribute to give cohesion to a group. For instance, we have seen earlier in some inscriptions how the utterance, the repeated utterance of someone's name was desired in order to enact commemoration. Um, we have seen in some of those examples as well that some reciprocity was looked for. And this is also based on this idea of, perf of performativity. Let's have a look at this tila here, uh, the one from Cairo that you will see on your, on your right. And on the description you will see, over there, all those who still live on earth, any scribe, any person who shall pass by this tila of mine, as you desire that your local gods favor you, you should say the breath of life to the nose of Wachisobek living again. So here, this individual is asking um, to be commemorated, and he's requesting some very specific actions from the audience in order to activate this remembrance. In this case, it's not simply performing or saying this invocation offering. He wants it to be said to his nose in order to make sure that he would benefit from that breath of life. So I think it would be fair here to speak of a rhetoric of language. So what we see here is how through these inscriptions, through these words, memory is being mobilized. But we need to remember that not everyone in Egypt would have been literate. Not everyone could read this tila. This is why I argue that in, in addition to this rhetoric of language, we also have a rhetoric of images that is participating in all of this um, um, kind of visual repertoire that we have from Middle Kingdom Stile. There are certain gestures and actions that are performed by figures on the Stile that will be widely recognized as gestures that would elicit that practice of memory. Here we have um, this example. Here we have this example from, uh, from, the, from the Vienna Museum, from the Stila of Seneb, and if you look very, very closely, you will see a number of individuals with a very, very long arm. This is clearly sending a message to anyone seeing that Stila that they, the, these people were expecting to have those invocation offerings pronounced in front of them. So what we're seeing here, again, is how memory doesn't simply happen memory needs to be enacted through embodied experience, through speech, and also through this type of bodily actions. Now, I introduced earlier to you one inscription from, uh, from one of the stele from Abidus that is, was anchoring that act of remembrance to the site of Abidus. And I think this is a good reminder of the importance of contextualization and also of the anchoring of memory to some specific places. And the idea of me that how memory can be anchored to places have been very much explored by uh, Janet Richards, for example, in relation to the site of Abydos. Now, Abydos, uh, which is located in the south of Egypt over there, is a site that boasts different <coughs> layers of um, topographical, political, mythical, and um, also historical associations that give coherence to the site as a ceremonial center and as a site of memory as well. And I think it is a really good case study in order to explore some of the issues that I have already introduced to you um, uh, today already. 
So um, Abidus, as I'm saying, was a site that was saturated with uh, cultic importance already from pre-dynastic times. Here you have a plan where you see some of the monuments that are um, located at the site of Abidus. And I want to draw your attention right now to this area that is called Um el Kab. Now, Um el Kab is uh, the, the area of the site where kings of the early dynastic had, had their tombs. They were buried in that, um, in that region. And here you have a close-up of that region where the, some of the tombs of those really early kings were located. And I want to draw your attention particularly to this tomb that I have marked here. This is the tomb of King Je. What is really interesting about uh, this tomb is that in the Middle Kingdom, this tomb was reinterpreted as the tomb of the god Osiris himself. So Egyptians of the Middle Kingdom um, thought that this tomb, or believed that this tomb, was uh, the, the, the tomb of Osiris himself, and as a result, a number of festivities and ritual activities uh, continued to take place uh, at the site in memory of the god Osiris. What happened during those ceremonies? Well, you will have noticed from the topography of the site that what we have there is a processional valley. This is a wadi, this is an old dry river course that was linking the region of Um el Kab that we have seen earlier with another really important section of the site. This is where the temple of Osiris was located. And as you see from the temple of Osiris to Um el Kab over there, there is, uh, you can get there very easily through this processional, uh, processional valley. And this was used in order to stage processions in honor of the god Osiris. Now, what was really interesting is that along this processional route, in hundreds, hundreds of commemorative stele and mud brick memorial chapels were erected. And these were erected by devotees who wanted to participate in those mysteries of Osiris for eternity. Now, unfortunately, the site was very, very heavily plundered, both in antiquity and particularly in the 19th and 20th centuries. So the archaeological context of many of these stele is actually not known um, anymore. But we were unwittingly lucky because one small part of this site was covered in the New Kingdom by the so-called portal of Ramses II. You may see from this map, very close to the Temple of Osiris, there is a place called um, Portal of Ramses II. And here you have a close-up of the excavations. When this uh, temple was um, excavated under the level of the floor, a number of foundations of different mud brick chapels were found um, in, that, uh, in that area. And from these, and here you have another um, close-up of, um, of the entrance of this portal temple of Ramses II. And I don't know if you can see my mouse, actually, probably not. But uh, behind there, you will see those mud brick foundations of where some of those chapels uh, would have been um, um, located. So what are these mud brick chapels that I keep referring to? They would be used in order to house different groups of stele and other monuments, sometimes, for example, offering tables, that would commemorate the ded dedicatee and his or her entourage. And this is really good material to study kinship, but I'm not here to talk about kinship today. I'm here to talk about something else, so I will shut up. <laughs> so. Um, we do not really have precise information about who and when visited the Abydos, but we know that this area, um, which is often known as the votive zone in Abydos, was, um, offers a unique opportunity to try and reconstruct this interaction of the audience with monuments and that creation of memory at the site. So the way overall two types of chapels. These chapels are not from this area of the votive zone, but from elsewhere in Abydos. I'm showing them here just to demonstrate to you what the different chapels would have looked like. But basically, we have two types of chapels, some single chambered um, uh, chapels and also solid kind of masses of brickwork. In both cases, different stele would have been embedded into those um, stele, as you see uh, from, this, uh, from these pictures here. The other thing that I want to draw your attention to is this map from the excavation of this area just underneath the temple of Ramses II. What we see here is that we're getting an idea of a fairly 
overfilled space. There would be still, uh, still, and obviously chapels absolutely everywhere. There is hardly any space there, is there? Uh, so we see smaller chapels filling in the space in between the bigger ones. And in this, saying, in this sense, I would argue that this relatedness, this association with other chapels was being um, sought by means of you know, space. And uh, this was being presented as a way for commemoration. Now, Abydos is a good example, I think, of how those monumental spaces may have had an effect on the audience. Because in this case, we have like the sheer quantity of stele and of chapels that is creating an idea of monumentality within the space. But another thing is that some of these chapels wouldn't be very big. Some of them, uh, some of them would be relatively small. So what we're seeing is that for those stele, in order to be displayed, in order to be seen, you would have to actively look for them. You would have to go crouching, squatting, crawling around abiders, trying to find all those stele. So, um, and also this overcrowdedness of the site could be reinforcing that feeling of community, that sense of belonging to a group. So I think that abiders is functioning here at very different levels as a site of commemoration that would help activate that, um, that memory and that community feeling. Many of these stele, again, would include appeals to the passers-by, as we have seen earlier, showing this interaction with the, uh, with the living and trying to persuade them in order to recite an invocation offering in the memory of the person who erected the stele. Now, you may remember some of the technologies of remembrance that I was mentioning earlier, and this idea of embodiment and the role of embodiment in remembrance. And I think what I am describing is precisely uh, reflecting that performative element as well as embodied aspects of commemoration. So bodily practices would include this wandering around chapels, this crouching to gain access to a stele, squatting to it, admire different images from stele, the actual physical act of erecting, of setting up a stele, listening to a recitation in an inscription. And this almost very sensory aspect of the site of abiders is acknowledged and recognized in some inscriptions as well. For example, we have this one from, um, uh, from Vienna as well, where we have, um, uh, where, where the, um, uh, the Stile owner says, I built for, for myself this chapel, being made effective, blah, 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 so that I can smell the incense that comes forth, that I may be provided with the sweet smell of the God. So all of this is acknowledging this very sensory perception of the landscape that is also so another dimension contributing to this enactment um, of memory. Now, Stile from Abiders may be a very good example to exemplify this social engagement with objects linked to a particular um, to a particular place. And but to finish, and, and, um, and this is directly related, as we see from this inscription, to those processions in honor of the god Osiris. These people wanted to participate in those processions. But to finish this presentation, I want to um, just show you one specific case study um, from late uh, Middle Kingdom abiders in order to exemplify how some of those technologies of remembrance are mobilized through monuments in Middle Kingdom abiders. So, for this example, I'm going to pick one particular chapel, one of these chapels. However, as I told you, most of these chapels from abiders have no archaeological context because of this history of plundering and looting that I was telling you about. So these connections of the landscape, to the landscape can only be uh, postulated. And what it is postulated is that groups of stele may have been associated with one particular chapel. Now, the existence and the reconstruction of these chapels is postulated on the basis of the work of William Kelly Simpson that you see uh, here on the screen. And he tried to reconstruct some of this chapel on the basis of the uh, prosopographies of the owners. He referred to them as Enoch groups, as those reconstructions, those groups that he reconstructed together. And Enoch stands for Abiders North Offering Chapel. And he reconstructed a good number of groups, um, and more have been added to that list over the years. And as I was telling you, unfortunately, the location of some of these chapels is not known, and we don't even know if they, if they existed 
um, as groups, we're just using the work of, uh, of Simpson as one possible hypothesis of how those chapels could have been reconstructed from a social and prosopographic perspective. So, um, okay. The chapel that I have chosen for you today is uh, number 44 from uh, Simpson's, uh, from Simpson's work. And this is the chapel of someone called Nefernai. This is dated to the reign of Sobek Hotep III on a stylistic grounds. And it consists of three different stele, as you see from the slide. There is further genealogical information about this group that can be obtained from other stelas, such as, for example, one from Leiden that I'm not discussing today. I'm sticking to the ones that were collected by Simpson today. And as you see, they are stylistically, in this case, very similar. This is not always the case. Sometimes they are very different, but here they are quite similar. If you look at the faces, for example, the shape of the beards, the slightly square shape of the hands, the layout with two colored bands at the bottom of the stele as well, and two of them have almost identical lunettes, these two um, over here, with uh, Min Hornacht and Ptasok Arosiris at the top on the lunette. This probably indicates that they might have been uh, made in the same workshop, but today we're not focusing on where those stele were made and you know those processes of manufacture. We're focusing on how or to what an extent they materialize different social groups and how they elicit those acts of remembrance. So that's what we're focusing on for the rest of the presentation. Now, the main person on this stele, undeniably, just by looking at this stele, is uh, Nefernai. So when we talk about the main person on the stele, in anthropological terms, I like to use the word ego, so um, the, the first person on the stele. And this is, we, we very easily identify Nefernai as the most important and prominent person on the stele, uh, because he's the largest within the stele, as you can see. All of the stele in the group are relatively small. They are 56 to 61 centimeters tall. And most of them have four to six people depicted on them. And they also include some captions. Um, now, as you can see, Nefernai is the largest of all the people being presented. Um, and he holds two different titles in this group of stele. One of them is Iri Pechet, that exist in all the different stele that we have of him. And on the one from, uh, from Paris, the one that you see here, he also has the title um, Shemes Sokar, so follower of Sokar or something like that. Um, now, something quite interesting is that the, there are some captions accompanying these figures. And very often in Middle Kingdom stele, some information that you will find in those captions is the title, the name of the individual, and very often also the affiliation and some kinship term, telling us how they relate to the main person on the stele. But something that's quite interesting about this group is that no kinship terms are mentioned and no affiliations are mentioned here. So the social background of the rest of the people here is also quite interesting. The some of the titles of other people represented in these groups is very varied. We have people from relative, with relatively low ranking titles, such as, for example, follower or attendant, but we have people with apparently very high ranking titles, for example, royal seal bearer or the uh, great overseer of the army and things like that. So it is challenging to find what brought these people together. We don't have any um, information related to kinship. We don't know their affiliations. We have the titles, and there is a huge disparity between the titles. So why are they all sharing the same stele together? Um, what, we, uh, what we see here is that most of them, despite having those very different and, uh, titles that allude to this disparity in social rank, they are represented in relatively equal terms. Do you see that? Nefernai is very, very big, and all the other people representing on the stele, they are all of more or less the same kind of size and, and, and scale. This is interesting because, as I said, there are very vast hierarchical differences between them. We have many other stele from the Middle Kingdom, especially from the late Middle Kingdom, that show all collaterals, what I like to call collaterals, 
also with very similar poses and sizes. Now, what do we mean by collaterals? These are people who are labeled in those captions as sen. Sen is a term in Egyptian that is actually quite difficult to translate. Very often it's translated as simply sibling, brother, but it can sometimes be also translated as colleague and it could mean different things. Um, so what we see on this stele are some, um, some individuals uh, who are represented much larger than the others. They are the most important people on the stele, but many others are from almost the e an equal size as well, and they are all labeled as Sen. Here you have another example, and um, I'm, I have included a close-up of this one, where you see that dozens sometimes of people are depicted on this stele. All of these people are, are labeled as Sen. Uh, in this particular case, they are probably all belonging to the same group of sculptors. Uh, but the, the, they are represented in a very similar way. Now, the main difference between something like this and the examples of Nefernai that we have seen earlier is that in Nefernai we do not use the term Sen. Here the term Sen is used. We know that they are collaterals. In the case of Nefernai, it's not used. But if we go back to that idea that I told you earlier, this rhetoric of images, we know that Egyptians of this time knew that when people are represented in a fairly similar way, that is probably evoking this idea of collaterality. So by means of this rhetoric of images, they are transmitting an idea about the kind of hierarchy that we have on this stele. So even though the term Sen is not being used, what we have perhaps is an alluded uh, relation of collaterality by analogy with different um, and other stile of the, um, uh, of the same period. Now, in this context, the audiences for this monument could probably identify those represented as collaterals on the basis of that shared knowledge of what a collateral needs to look like in stile. Okay, the other aspect that I want to discuss with you is uh, how audience is a fundamental consideration when thinking of the role that monuments play on memorialization. Now, in this group of stele, what we have is one of them with a very elaborate appeal to the living that is reinforcing this desire to engage with an audience and by means of an invitation to others to perform memory. So in this one, in this uh, stele from Florence, we have this relatively long um, appeal to the living presented there. This is carved in very large hieroglyphs in the upper half of the stele, but we have her about eight lines there. And this is definitely the focus of the composition. So what we see here is large hieroglyphs that are dominating the stela. These are about three times the size of the hieroglyphs in the lower part of the stela. And it's worth noting, if we think back of the archaeological context of Abydos, this very crowded space with sometimes very small stela, if you put hieroglyphs that are this big, that's probably because you really want people to realize that you have that appeal there. You want to draw the attention to that, um, uh, to that appeal. Um, some sections of this appeal include sentences such as, for example, the breath of the mouth is beneficial for the deceased and one does not become weary of this. This is part of the so-called breath of the mouth formula and it's very similar to other expressions of reciprocity of good actions that we have seen earlier. So you may remember that we said earlier, the one uh, who says my name, I will be their protector and here they are emphasizing the same kind of, kind of thing, you know, say my name please because you don't get tired from saying my name. Uh, so these phrases are all emphasized in a kind of performative interaction of the audience with that monument. And this is implicitly, once again, asserting this idea of a shared cultural identity and shared cultural values that are materialized in this stele. So here what we're seeing is that rhetoric of images alluded to earlier and in addition to that, this rhetoric of language that is making use of stock phrases and formulaic expressions in order to transmit an idea that relies on the social knowledge of the audience. So for example, sometimes some of these inscriptions include notes like, 
say an invocation offering in my name, but they do not say what the invocation offering is like. They are assuming that you, as a member of the audience, are a member of a community of practice that will know how to perform one of those, um, uh, one of those invocation offerings. Now, the final element that I want to discuss here today is how these stila are anchor remembrance to a particular place. So as I have already mentioned a few times, the provenance of these monuments is unknown. We don't know exactly where they came from in Abydos. So an archaeological, a precise archaeological contextualization is not possible. But it's worth remembering that probably all of these stila were part of a chapel that was conceived as a concrete unit of memorialization. Now, there are plenty of inscriptions that allude to steal it being parts of chapels. For example, we have this one from the British Museum that says, you know, oh, uh, it is my father, Ichenofred, justified, who, uh, who commanded that this stila is set up for me in his chapel of justification. How amazing is this? We're seeing how someone is given permission to erect stila inside or by the chapel of somebody else, hence creating those material links with that, um, with that person. Now, the term used here for chapel is the term machat, and this, I have explored this term elsewhere. And what, but one thing that's really important about Mahat is that it is the evocation of space for commemoration that is very often linked to different landmarks from the site of Abydos in particular. The inscription of Nefernai, however, does not include the term Mahat. Instead, what we find is another term. This is the term Shepes. Um, and this term is really interesting because what we have here is not a reference to the physical shape of the stele. What we have here is an allusion to some of the functions of this particular stele. And two functions can be assumed from the use of the term shepes. And this is known from lexicographical studies in relation to the term shepes. First of all, a term stele that is known as shepes is a stele that is meant to be displayed. And this is, no, and is meant to be seen as well very explicitly. This is known from other stele. For example, here you have this instruction description from Estila in, um, in Toulouse, where it says, all living ones, every white priest, every elector priest, every scribe who shall see this chapel as you pray, ta, you um, shall leave your offices to your children. It's not simply anyone who shall pass by this Estila. They are very explicitly encouraging people to look at this Estila and see it. The second thing that I want to emphasize is that the majority of stele called shepes are associated with appeals to the living. And these appeals are foregrounding this desire for interaction with the audience, asking all those living people who pass by to recite an invocation offering in the memory of the person uh, um, for whom the stele was erected. So the term shepes is denoting that this object was meant to be interacted with, and perhaps it was set up very close to some of those processional routes in order to uh, maximize that contact with passers-by. This is just a hypothesis, but of course, we don't know the exact archaeological context of this dealer. Now, if we go back to this, following Jones and his ideas of technologies of remembrance, we see how those technologies are arguably articulated in this one example of Nefernai. Because we're seeing here three different aspects of how memory works in this particular site of Abydos. We see a group being commemorated together while relying on the social knowledge of the audience that should be able to interpret the relationships that are being represented on it. We see how these monuments are addressing explicitly the audience by means of explicit appeals to the living that will prompt performative action on the part of the viewer. And finally, these are creating also a symbolic space that would prompt the celebration of memory by virtue of those interactions. So it is for this reason that I would argue that objects are not memory. Objects seed 
see within those networks of relations and encourage the creation of memory. So, for my final remarks, I will say that in this presentation I have tried to explore the role that memory plays in this weaving of ancient Egyptian social fabric. Now, monuments contributed to perpetuating ideas of authority, of status, of kinship, and my approach is very much based on the idea of social memory from Halbash as a phenomenon, so memory as a phenomenon that is mediated by society and very much anchored in social practices. Stile, which are commemorative monuments must have been affected by the contemporary understanding of the social structure. But in my approach, I do not take just stile. I try to group those stile together into chapels, which would have been the focus of memory. Um, and they may have conceived by the Egyptians themselves, as we're seeing, as units of memory. Those chapels are constructing and are materializing relationships that are then perpetuated in the memory of the visitors. Contemporary, and as we see, future visitors as well, whether those relationships are real or not. So my approach, I guess, is based on groups, not just from the point of view of groups of people, but also from the point of view of groups of monuments as well. Then, um, in ancient Egypt and in Middle Kingdom Abydos in particular, we may access memory through monuments, but they do not perform, monuments do not perform memory on their own. They require an audience, not necessarily even humans, uh, then that will make use of those technologies of remembrance to anchor that remembrance in social practice that includes bodily actions and interactions. And finally, what I have been trying to do through this paper is to present a definition of memory that derives directly from Egyptian uh, monuments. Um, and this definition is that memory, at least here in Abydos, is situated, is embodied, is performative, and is actively constructed. Now, why? Memory is situated because the role of stele and chapels is very much embedded in one particular landscape, and this is exemplified by the interaction of those monuments with people who pass by and with that processional route as well. Memory is embodied because there will be personal sensory aspirations that are sometimes encoded in those inscriptions as well, such as this desire to see the festival, to smell the incense of the god. And this played a very important role in how that memory was being enacted. Um, now, memory is performative because an interaction with passers-by is required in order to reinforce uh, those ideas of memory. And then memory was uh, both prompted by different actors and expected from the audience for a full realization of remembrance. So it is for this reason that it is fair to say that memory will never be passive. Instead, it will be actively constructed. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriele. I thought that was not too fast. Was that okay? <laughs> Thank you very much, Leire. Uh, I, I can't say how much I, I'm happy uh, for, for this talk. It was really an amazing talk. And I'm still thinking of many things, um, but I would like to open to the to the public um, for questions. So, sorry. is there any question? I'm sorry, something that I, I would like to say, if that's okay, is that if you if you're really shy to ask questions, you're more than welcome to approach me later at the end. I promise I don't bite, and I have also put my email here, and I'm more than happy to receive questions by email as well. Thanks so much, Leire, mm. for this wonderful presentation and for being so inspiring and eloquent. Um, you touched upon themes that are very close to my heart, like appeals to the living, but also, and I regret not having <laughs> studied the, the appeals that are before the New Kingdom because I think there, there's so much potential for 
for comparisons and um, yeah, and, 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 and thoughts about the, the context and, and the different strategies that were used and how those are reflected on, on the appeals themselves. Um, you, as Paolo said, so many thoughts have come to my mind during, during your lecture. Um, one thing that I wanted to ask you, but then you kind of answered me uh, through the Stila from Florence, is how you, you perceive, for instance, competitive display, because you, you, you showed uh, very, like, very well all these different technologies and strategies um, uh, to, 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 to make memory, if you pass me the, the, the verb. Mm. Um, uh, but in, in a context such as Abido's, they must have been in competition. Um, so um, the Stila from Florence is a very excellent example uh, of, of how they might have fight over uh, to get to grab more attention. And this is a bit of a commentary. And if you would like to develop a bit more, uh, mm. I'd be more than happy. A question, though, um, is about, I very much agree with you that um, um, like memory is something embedded in a society mm. and is actively uh, performed um, and in a way it works with our society as well, the way we receive and, and, and understand uh, memory. Um, in many instances in, in ancient Egypt, we talk about monuments that were no, not meant to be visible. Mm. Um, I don't have a specific example in mind, um, but um, can you think of something like a memorial stila that was not uh, meant to be visible and that despite that was still performing memory in such a way that was, um, I don't know, um, working with, with a different kind of audience perhaps, or how do you think this might have worked? Thank you. Okay, yeah, your idea of competitive display is well definitely spot on and this is something we have seen with that stila from, from Florence as you see from the perspective of how the hieroglyphs were carved really large and they are definitely attracting that kind of attention. It is something that we see with the shape and some perhaps unusual elements of some stele. For example, the perforated ankh that we have seen on one of the stele before. Um, there are also kind of uh, sometimes almost like mummy form little figures embedded in some of the stele as well. I think many of those are there in order to attract this attention and to make sure that your stele is looked at within a, a, an atmosphere of competitive display, as you say. Um, in terms of stele that we're not meant to be seeing, um, the one example that I can think of is, uh, is actually going back to the Old Kingdom. And I can think of some examples from the Old Kingdom where um, Stiele were eventually covered uh, by a later monument and you know when that monument was erected there they could have replaced the Stiele and moved it but they didn't they just left it there so perhaps just the presence of the Stiele behind that other monument was meant to you know make sure that that person continued to be present there even if the monument was not seen now the person who put the stele there in the first place probably wanted to have their stele seen <laughs> so that we have a cognitive issue <laughs> a cognitive problem there but uh, no i can't think of any examples from this stele from the from this corpus from the middle kingdom where we could say for certain that the stele was not meant to be seen and people would not want to have their stele seen uh, but there may be some but i don't i, I don't know them yeah, thank you Thank you, Leir. I'm thinking also particularly about the topic that was just addressed on who would see those stila when. I mean, if we really think about their functionality, let's say, in this kind of Osiris mysteries, mm. then I would imagine many people being present during the proper processions and the festival, but for the rest of the year, do you think that there was much let's say, people coming and going, visiting these stila, 
I would imagine the site for the most part of the year rather being an empty site without any people and only being properly populated at the moment of the performance of the Osiris Festival. Mm -hmm. And then people who were connected with these individuals who set up these chapels being present and going there and then interacting uh, with this. So I, I, I personally see this space rather, let's say, all year round rather empty mm -hmm. and really heavily populated during these uh, festivals. What, what would be your take yeah. on that? So, uh, th thank you so much for that question. Uh, at this point, we can only speculate about that, really. I mean, we could say that, uh, the, obviously, during the Festival of Osiris, the site would be heaving with people, there would be people everywhere, and that would add to the monumentality of the place, that sense of, you know, being part of a group that's celebrating together. And we could say, well, perhaps the rest of the year, it was empty, but perhaps, it was also visited during the rest of the year. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't usually kind of like doing these things, but if you think about, if you think about nowadays, you know, um, some, um, I don't know, for example, um, for example, Santiago, going back, obviously I'm from Spain, if you can't tell from my accent, if we think about Santiago, for example, when uh, the, 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 there, is, there is a particular time where it is celebrated, and obviously the Cathedral of Santiago is heaving with people and there are many people, but all year round there will be people going to the cathedral as well and visiting the area. So perhaps something like that could have been expected of providers as well. Perhaps people would go at some point. We, unfortunately, we cannot tell. But, uh, you know, deep down, I want to see all these dealers having, receiving some love all, all year round and, <laughs> and not being lonely. So, yeah, I like to see Abidus as a place where people may go all year round occasionally, where, although there would be one particular time of the year when it will be uh, more populated. <laughs> Other questions? <clears throat> Altra domanda? I have another more, let's say, iconographical or um, stila decorum question. The yeah. stila in Florence that you showed yeah. starts immediately with the title and the name of the owner. Is this weird or not? I have not really seen stila that immediately start with iripeget uh, nefernai, mm -hmm. but in most cases there's always an offering formula, affiliation, or any kind of text format which is used to introduce the social identity of the person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What would you make out of this? Any idea? So sometimes we do have that. Sometimes we have, um, you know, a, a directly the, 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 the title or even the name of the individual or simply he says and then they go on to say whatever he says, right? Um, and the, I think the key to interpreting those stile is to think of them in groups <laughs> and how probably that, I mean, if you, if you look at it in isolation, perhaps you think, well, th this guy was very rude. That is a very abrupt start. Why, would you, why wouldn't you introduce yourself in a, in a proper way? <laughs> but if you think about how that stile would be part of a group, perhaps all the stile within the group would be complementing that, uh, that other stile and, and yeah and uh, um, yeah, adding up to that uh, visual and monumental presentation of this individual, I think. <laughs> you also showed the other stila in black and white where you did the kind of section of those people walking from the right to the left. It was interesting to see that their social identity marks are written you know, with a different orientation. Is it, how would you make sense of this? I mean, it, Is it more, let's say, the kind of usual writing direction from the right to the left, whereas the people? So I think you're referring to, yes, yes. to this one? No, no, the, to the one that you just showed. Oh, sorry. This one, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, of course, I had to Because those that people one. are walking in this direction, whereas their, let's say, Senet F, Ren. Yeah are to be read from this direction. So there's an interesting, let's say, bi-directionality. Yeah, that, that is interesting. And this stila in particular is, uh, is quite interesting. Ah, okay. So it's... Because of how... Oh, 
because of how the, the bottom registers are organized mm -hmm. as well and how the inscription in the bottom register is organized as well. But sometimes you find some weird things on Stile mm -hmm. and, a really yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and a really good example of that is precisely the, this Stile from, from here, from Turing. I'm going to come and visit the Turing Museum, it's fantastic. And you will get to see fantastic Stile such as this one that I have here in the background. So um, something that I discovered when looking at this Stile is that actually you don't read this in the direction that it seems you should be reading it. If you read in that direction, shouldn't we expect to see the inscription before? But it's not organized in that way. So actually that really tricked me when I was first studying this tele. I, I couldn't make sense of the genealogy of these individuals. But then when I started, uh, when I realized that this is the way in which we read it, it all makes sense. So um, sometimes you find how they're playing with display in many of these stile, which is one of the really interesting and fun things about playing with stile. And the, the one that you were pointing out, this one, I believe what we have here is, uh, we don't have time to go into this, but this is, I think, a diachronic representation of a workshop of sculptures uh, over time and how different people have been part of that workshop of, uh, of sculptures. And being sculptures, perhaps they are playing with the placement of some of those captions as well, and they are being creative in the way they are presenting themselves. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Come to the Museo Egizio. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to, to ask another, um, another thing. I don't know if maybe it's an impossible question, but um, <clears throat> do you imagine that there's also some kind of social divide in the use of memory and the way, uh, the importance that memory had for different groups, uh, meaning, you, you talked about uh, groups of practice and uh, people that could afford a monument like this one or a chapel and people that could read. Uh, you also uh, mentioned uh, illiterate people that might have been uh, looking at the images and gestures and but um, do you think I mean all, I'm thinking of all the people that could not afford a monument like this one and maybe could not even afford um, some kind of tomb with a chapel or with an inscription so common people mm -hmm. uh, being buried in a simple burial mm -hmm. um, would this kind of memory and remembrance and performance of memory be important to them as well, or um, this is when we need a time mach a time machine. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, no. That, but that is yeah. such an interesting question because, of course, something that perhaps. I haven't emphasized enough is to what an extent what we have is. Uh, a material register that refers to a, to a very small percentage of the population. And many of the technologies of remembrance or many of these ways of embodying memory that I have been referring to so far would probably be obviously relevant to these people, but the majority of the population, I, I do not know. I don't think I can answer that question, although I would love to. Um, I'm sure that they would have ways of enacting memory. And even in those, um, you know, simple burials, as you mentioned, that um, may have been even perhaps left unmarked or with minimal marking, um, there would have been ways in which that memory was enacted. How? I don't know. Or whether those ways were comparable to the ones I have shown here, I don't know either. This is why one of the things I said is that I think this technologies of memory and this way of studying memory needs to be very, very contextual, which is why this model that I am presenting may work for Middle Kingdom abiders, but perhaps it's not, may not be so relevant for other places. It is just a model, and I'm sure that um, 
you know, for other segments of the population, other or comparable models may have existed, but how we access those, I'm not sure. Okay. Thank you. So I thank you again, and let's give our guest a nice big applause, please.